Well, hello there. This is Vitual's the Chess Noob, learning and having fun with chess. Merch at chessnoob64.com. Now, I played this game recently, and when I discovered afterwards that the opening that my opponent played was known as the whale variation, I knew that I had to put it on my channel. Let's go take a look at this opening. Now, I've got the black pieces, and my opponent leads with the English opening. C4, perfectly good. Uh, against that, I usually play E5, and now E4. So that arrangement is the whale. Eyes now, you white whale. Show us your crooked jaw. Show us your wrinkled brow. Rise. The birds. The birds! He rises! white whale and one of the things about the whale opening is uh, thinking about a uh, sort of, sort of general chess concept, whenever a pawn moved forward it leaves something behind in terms of its defence. And one of the weaknesses of the whale is the d4 square, because this square is not attacked or defended by any of white's pawns and cannot be by any of white's pawns from this point onwards. And this of course gives us a sense of where we should play immediately. Bishop to c5, uh, now we've got very strong control of that square. Now from this point onwards the opening actually plays pretty normally. So knight f3, knight c6, bishop e2, I develop the other knight, they now push d3, I play d6, and now they short castle. So they castle fairly quickly on move six. Everything here is basically okay, pretty much close to zero, zero, zero. Now, what am I going to do here? Now, one of the things about the white whale, uh, you know, uh, with some Moby Dick, is that it's a tale about revenge. And I did feel a little bit vengeful against my opponent here. This was actually the second game we played. The first came at almost 80 moves, and at the end of those 80 moves, I lost the game. Basically, I screwed up the, uh, the end game. So I kind of wanted a win in this one. Given that my opponent has castle kingside so early, strategically, I've got a very clear idea of what I want to do. Basically, I want to immediately launch an attack on White's king, on the king side, move all my pieces towards the king side to launch a massive attack. They're not attacking me at the moment, so tactically, I might delay. Uh, I might delay castling. I might potentially try to push these pawns up. I'm going to try to rotate. Uh, these pieces towards the king side, and I'm gonna get want to get rid of this knight, which of course defends the h2 pawn. So here I play my first somewhat provocative move, knight forward to d4. Now you can see Stockfish reckons that sort of developing the other bishop first might be better, but basically here white should take, and I basically get rid of one of their defensive pieces. They do that, captures, captures. And now I've got my bishop in a very nice position, sort of looking at the f-pawn, of course pinned to their king. Uh, now they develop another knight, that's fine, it's on kind of the wrong side, I suppose they should develop uh, that side. I now decide to play c6, and basically you can see two intervening squares between the knight, which means the knight can't really move forward in this direction, so I was pretty happy with that. They um, develop their other bishop wanting to trade, that's fine, I would prefer that they take it this way, so I capture here uh, with, uh, with an attack on the knight, and given they can't move forward, potentially with some tempo, so let's now push h5. You can see Stockfish reckons taking this way is better, allowing white to open up this, uh, open up their f file, but doubling their pawns. I didn't really want them to open up their f file actually, so h5, and here potentially, you know, I've got um, some defense of that g4 square, which is what I wanted. So they take, that's fine, captures, I don't mind that that's doubled because I win some tempo. Knight forced to undevelop, very very good, and now knight jumps forward. You can get, again see Stockfish doesn't entirely believe in its attack, they do agree with attacking on the king side with g5, but here 
I was expecting that they're going to see this, you know, they don't want to take, but oh, let's, let's push a pawn in. And that's what they did. H3. And here I've got queen to h4, allowing that capture, potentially sacrificing the knight, and that is rated a brilliant move. Because the idea here is, is if they take this way, I then open up my h file, the rook and queen are in a battery, attacking down the h file is extremely powerful. Now here, white thinks for a bit, then they take this way, that's fine, I still get to open up the h file. Um, here I think they thought a little bit more, I'm not entirely sure what they were thinking of here, maybe they thought I would capture en passant, but you know, en passant's not a force move, you know, it's not chaos chess, and now, take. Basically opening things up, uh, they try to bring the queen, take. You know, this pawn is definitely the MVP here, take, they capture, and now this is open, this is open, white is in some serious trouble, look at that evaluation, it's basically about minus six in my advantage. So here, bishop out, but basically skewering uh, the queen to, uh, well basically uh, a skewer of the queen and the rook, there we go, they want to trade queens, that's fine, take, they take, take, they take, and now the long castles, and at the end of this, you know, we move basically kind of into towards an end game where I have two activated rooks. They've got a knight and a rook, but neither of them are developed. My king, knight and safe, their king really, really exposed. I am one pawn up. I think I've got seven pawns and they have six pawns. And in this position, I'm completely winning. So they try to, you know, you know, move their king across, that's fine. Captures, now two pawns up. Bring the other uh, rook, uh, rook here now. They try to attack, that's good. Form a battery, that's good. Give a check, king falls back. And now, here what I want to do is to potentially deflect their knight and allows me to infiltrate with my rooks. They take, I take. Here they bring that back, that makes sense. Give a check. Now here, wanting to take, and here, white's actually playing fairly accurately. They're playing pretty well. I think what they saw was potentially if they can get their knight here, they've got a fork of my two rooks. That's really, really clever. So they push that pawn, and I think they thought if I take, they've got that fork. But I saw that. It's not a problem. It's not a problem because I've got checks. So here, captures, captures, check. So they cannot take this way, and because my rook controls the entire, uh, the entire rank, the king cannot move really forward. So they move in this direction, looking like they wanted to potentially attack that, uh, that rook. However, that doesn't work because now I've got check, that's a pin, and here white decided to resign. And in fact here, I think there's a mate in, oh, let me just, I think it's a mate in eight or mate in seven, and I don't even need to, uh, I don't even need to take uh, that, uh, that knight, because here, the king is probably gonna be forced here, and then it's, it, I've got, you know, this, uh, basically this skewer, basically I get to capture their rook for free. This rook, of course, is defended. It's looking really bad for white. Good game, GG. Now I managed to get my revenge in this game, and the big takeaway is to keep the eye on the prize, the opponent's king. When the opponent is a little bit slow, especially in the early middle game, launching a really big attack will often be overwhelming, even when it's not perfectly accurate. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.